Hi, I'm Becky Crook and I'm currently the Bereavement Specialist Midwife for UHL. I'm here today because I want to talk about my journey, my journey as mum and midwife to a child who lives with HIE and what that means for me and my family. I hope that my video will be an influence to your clinical practice and will help you think that little bit more extra when you're looking after these patients. Thank you for your time. So the topics of discussion today in my journey will be a midwife's perspective, my personal experience, what is HIE, the national guidance and practice pitfalls, transactional practice, the brave conversations we need to be having. It doesn't just stop at the baby. End of life care, living with HIE and what that means for the wider family, personal and professional balance, and recommendations for improved practice. So, a midwife's perspective. So by 2017, I'd been a midwife for seven years. I'd felt really confident in my role, had had the privilege of working across postnatal wards, antenatal wards, labour wards, maternity admissions. I'd been out to Ethiopia and worked there. I'd done some teaching, preceptorship, mentorship. I felt really alive in my role and confident in it. My previous experience with my first child had been one of trauma, prematurity, cesarean sections, general anaesthetics, long neonatal stays. So being pregnant again, this was going to be my redemptive birth. Now, just four weeks before Caleb was born, I was out at a home birth and everything was fine. Everything proceeded as normal. And one, suddenly this baby was born and the baby was born with no signs of life. And I had to resuscitate that baby. And it felt wholly embarrassing to stand there, heavily pregnant, also with a boy, and I was resuscitating a boy. And we had to go through the ambulance journey of resuscitation. We had to declare at arrival to the hospital that this baby had indeed passed away. No baby had ever died on my watch. And suddenly here I was, moments and weeks before I was going to be giving birth myself to my son and this baby had passed away. I'd never had an experience like it and now my professional perspective on what home birth looked like, on what birthing naturally looked like, was completely tarnished. I remember the woman embracing me and saying thank you so much for the way that you looked after me, thank you for all that you did for our son. She thanked me, it just didn't make any sense. How would someone grieve like that? I thought she'd be angry, as angry as I felt about my previous birth experience. But she invited me to the funeral and I went through that professional experience. But it's also how I ended my maternity leave. I went on maternity leave knowing that that's exactly how my last, my last delivery was going to feel like. And it left me scared and wondering. So I took the time out to make sure that I really concentrated on the last part of my pregnancy. I really looked after myself, sat and contemplated, tried to make birth plans. How could I reduce the risk in my situation? But realistically, this is the unpredictable nature of pregnancy and labour. And what I was needing to know was that ways I were controlling it. But little did I know that in the future, I'd be living out a tangible nightmare. So my expectations, the birth was going to be a redemptive birth. I imagined that it would be really fulfilling, it'd be a time of renewal, it'd be a time of healing from my previous trauma. I'd sit quietly and contemplate my birth. I was going to hold my son awake because I had a previous general anaesthetic. I was going to have skin to skin, never had that with my daughter, she was rushed away. I was going to be able to hear that first cry, never have I heard my own children's first cry, and to examine every inch of them myself, that my hands would be the first on my baby, and to experience the, the feeling of that and the euphoria of that perfect birth. I was 39 weeks and five days. I'd woke that morning feeling a little bit under the weather, niggling a little bit. There wasn't anything really giving me any signs that I was going to be going into labour. I'd not had contractions before, so I proceeded about my day. I took my daughter to nursery. I attended a growth scan at midday. 
And we joked about how long it was going to take me to go into labour. And we even joked about the fact that maybe we'll have a membrane sweep in a couple of days when it'd be a September baby rather than an August baby. There was nothing that was really indicating to us that it was going to be happening that day. I'd had coffee with a friend, watched Moana, made a sausage stew. And then suddenly around about half four, I thought, oof, these contractions have changed. And so I went to a bath, get ready for going into labour ward maybe later that night. I then found myself contraction after contraction after contraction. And suddenly I stood in the bath, my waters broke and my baby's head was there. I screamed for help and I could scream for support and we got the ambulance crew there just in time. But at that point it was far too late. He was on his way. Caleb was born. He showed minimal signs of life. They immediately started resuscitation. I was in a living nightmare, no pain relief, complete shock. And once again, my birth experience had been robbed from me. No redemption here, just a tangible nightmare. Suddenly I wanted to be asleep under the, the general anaesthetic back in that theatre where I was going to be protected by my colleagues instead here, here I am, completely out of control. They whisked him away. All I heard were these terminal gasps. I couldn't, they couldn't tell me anything. The community midwives turned up, tried to reassure me, but I leapt up from that bed. I pulled up my trousers and, and I said, I just need to go, I need to go. But I also remember feeling just innate shock, like, I was, like it literally was a nightmare that I was sleeping and suddenly I'll wake up and everything will be fine. My daughter was whisked away and now here I am sat in the back of an ambulance. As I arrived at the A&E department, I sat in a wheelchair and felt really unwell. I hadn't realised that I'd sustained severe tearing, but none of that mattered. I don't remember feeling anything. All I remember is walking, you know, being pushed into the A&E department and uh, feeling like a movie moment where people were standing either side, knowing that I was this midwife mother that was walking in to then suddenly see their baby in an incubator making no movement and the doctors looking at me with such sadness in their eyes. Suddenly, I pricked up, I donned my midwifery cap and I asked about what the blood gases were doing. I asked about what the prognosis was. I asked about what the next care plan would be. Suddenly, straight into that moment of, I am going to be in control, I have to be in control, otherwise I, my brain might explode from all of this information. They gave me the information, the blood gases, and the blood gases were horrendous. The blood gases were terminal. The blood gases were that of a baby that was never going to come out of this situation unscathed. And suddenly, everything started to fall apart. So I find myself being wheeled up to labour ward. All of my lovely colleagues looking at me, thinking, what's going on here? What's, why is Becky Crook here? Why, what's happened? And all I could shout out was, it was an accident. I didn't mean to give birth at home. I mean, I was a previous cesarean, I'd planned to come in. Why would I give birth at home? And suddenly I found myself in this shock period. That night I went to the theatre for a repair of a three-seater. After that, I remember feeling so wiped out, my brain just shut down. I had minimal contact on the neonatal unit. I didn't know what was going on. But I was also hoping that as soon as I fell asleep, then it'd just be all a bad nightmare and I'd wake up and still be pregnant and we could do this all over again in the redemptive euphoric way I'd planned for. But that wasn't the case. I woke up that morning, got out of bed as quick as I could, showered down and made my way down. I had to have some sort of control somewhere. I had to get in there and stand by the side of the incubator and wait for the exciting news that it was just, you know, he's fine, he's fine. He's, his gases came up and he seems to be doing really, really well. But instead, I saw my baby in a cooling incubator, covered in wires, covered in all of these machines that I'm supposed to know about, but I'm a midwife, not a neonatal nurse. I'd carried my career out in ignorance, not knowing what happens to those babies that are whisked off to a neonatal unit. So suddenly I found myself trapped 
in having no control and no knowledge as to what's going on. I was tending to the incubator as much as I could. I expressed more milk than I'd ever attempted before because for some bizarre reason, I thought, you know, my breast milk will heal my baby's brain. It was something that I could, I could do for him. Whilst all these doctors did everything, what could I do for him? Retrospectively, what struck me about this is what is it that parents see? The parents, the doctors see this baby crawling, you know, they're doing everything they're supposed to be. Look at us, like we've done an amazing job on this baby. They're receiving all the care that they need. But as a mother, you just look at it, you feel frightened. What have you done to my baby? Why is my baby looking like this? And it's that variation that as professionals, with our professional caps on, we don't see. And perhaps we need to look a little bit deeper into how we communicate with our patients. I think for a long time, I lived in a lot of denial. I think for the first year of Caleb's life, I lived in denial. This was not gonna happen, it's gonna be fine. Suddenly we found ourselves sitting down, having a conversation about an MRI that was catastrophic. The results were, he's not gonna live. Then I'm sat in quiet rooms with members of staff who have said, you need to pull the plug out. It's only 18 hours into your cooling process, but you need to pull it. There's nothing, there's no activity here on the, on the CFAM report, so we need to get this. We need to withdraw care. We feel it's in his best interest. And I remember thinking to myself, best interest? Who, who gets control of the best interest? But here I am. Perhaps they were doing it in his best interest. Would that have been the right decision? Memory making. I do memory making now as a professional. I sit and do handprints, footprints, and provide them with all of these wonderful items in a box. That was me five years ago, doing that, making those memories, and thankful for those moments, really thankful for those moments. But again, never was it gonna happen to me. Of course it wasn't gonna happen to me. I've heard it happening to other people, but here I was, handprints, footprints for my baby. So here I was standing next to an incubator, as I said, in a cool, baby's in a cooling jacket. I mean, what is HIE? I'd heard of it before. I knew that it happened to babies, but hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, you know, what does that mean? And we know that HIE is where there's a lack of oxygen and blood flow to the brain. This can occur before, during, or after labor and birth. And it affects about two to four per thousand births. The extent of HIE varies hugely, and I've seen that happen. I've seen babies walk, uh, go home unscathed, and I've seen babies that have passed away. It's categorised as mild, moderate, and severe. Caleb's diagnosis was severe. This categorisation is determined through several tests, an MRI, clinical presentation, and they all reveal the extent of the brain injury. Caleb unfortunately showed all of those signs. I remember laying there thinking, you just look so peaceful in that incubator. Surely he's gonna be fine, he's gonna wake up. I remember being so excited that he'd had urine output and I was like, oh, he's gonna be fine. He should, look, his organs want to work. He's got fights in him yet, but also feeling this grave sense of dread. On this slide, I say here that this was an image of me almost. My head completely overloaded. I'd been on the neonatal unit plenty of times as a professional, but again, never thought it was applicable to my practice. But yet here I am as a mother, I've got words like CFAM, EEG, intubated, extubated, cooling, input and output, blood gases, therapeutic cooling. How is this happening to me? All of these, words, procedures, processes, big ward rounds where I felt both seen and yet visible. I remember my husband at the time feeling really invisible. Suddenly I donned my midwifery cap again, stand in the middle of that ward round and what's our care plan next? Have you tested for this, this, this and this? Because again, it was about me centering myself and having some form of control. But nobody was checking in just to say, it's okay not to be okay, it's okay to not understand it all. 
But again, go back to that point of, as a professional, we know that these things, all these things are helping out the babies, they need everything. But for the parents out there, for myself as a mother, I felt completely overwhelmed that my, my baby looks so just vulnerable. I couldn't do anything. All these wires attached. And what for? I couldn't even see his face, couldn't see his beautiful face. And I think it's up to us as professionals to work a little bit more intrinsically with each other and understand each other's role that little bit more so that we can be that voice for the women as midwives. They've been through a journey with us for nine months. We need to learn a little bit more as to what goes on there on the neonatal unit so that we can support them. So we'd got to day 10. I'd held on to as much control as I could have. I sat down with the doctors and then suddenly we were having a conversation about end of life care, palliative care. My baby's having palliative care. What the heck went on? They talked a bit with drawing, extubating, and that really now you needed to invite your family in and have that end of life time and make those memories, have those photos, have those last cuddles. Suddenly I found myself feeling everything all at once. I'd gone actually 10 days of feeling relatively numb, like I was part of the MDT, that we were the team looking after this patient. But now they're having a conversation with me about rainbows, hospice. And this was an area that we could go to for end of life care because I was terrified that his big sister, who's already been exposed to enough at two and a half, I've already had to sit down and have that conversation with her about her little brother passing away and that some babies can't be here not knowing the right words, probably saying the wrong words. And now we're needing to go to a hospice, uplift everything from our family and go and live there. But I was terrified that she'd be the person to find Caleb not alive anymore. So we had a conversation about rainbows and suddenly I found myself in the back of an ambulance with Caleb. And even for a little bit of control, I asked them, please put the pulse oximetry on. And they said, I really don't think that's a good idea, Becky. I was like, please, I just need to know that he's alive. I can't let him die in an incubator in the back of an ambulance. He needs to die in my arms if he's gonna go. So uh, they had the pulse oximetry on. And obviously the readings were completely skewed. They were awful readings. But even if we had to pull over on the side of a motorway or an A road, I was gonna get in the back of that incubator and hold him in his final moments. So there wasn't a chance that I was gonna miss that. We arrived at Rainbows and was greeted by a big team of loving people who honoured the sacred nature of both life and death. They saw it as this opportunity for, to give me permission to feel, to adjust my mindset about suddenly I've been so clinical and this baby's going to die to suddenly, actually, Becky, you know, some babies do come through this and we will do everything that we can do. I just signed a respect form to say that my baby shouldn't have resuscitation because the brain injury was too severe. And yet I've then got another group of people telling me that things could be okay. It was a real culture shift from a clinical environment to a hospice environment. At first I felt really resistance to a, resistance to a hospice because that's where people go to die. I don't want to admit that that's potentially what's gonna to happen to my baby. But instead I was welcomed like a family, a sense of acceptance that it's okay, this sacred space for death to happen if it needs to. And it was that joy and pain colliding that is a unavoidable phenomenon of life that we will all experience at some point. But the end of life care that we received at Rainbows was exceptional and they continue to support us to this day. I remember them holding him through recurrent apneas, helping my daughter, she calls it the holiday hospice. You know, they do arts and crafts with her, handprints, memory making, just to help transition her in all of this as well. And that she didn't need to feel the pain of death or the potential of it. But it was an incredible start to the journey of living with HIE. So here are some quite intimate pictures here of my son Caleb. 
that's him with his sister. Look how excited she is to have a little brother. Even with all of those tubes, she was never phased by it. She was just so excited to hold him. And this was the day that we extubated him. That middle picture is where I just lay with him and had time with him without all of those tubes. And the next picture is him learning to smile in this world today. So what does living with HIE look like? Because what we do as professionals is we wave these families by, go by, see you later, you know, hope you and your baby are okay. We wave them out of the doors. But what does life look like on the other side? It looks like providing medication six times a day to a child that can't walk, can't talk, can't hold his own head, can't hold his own torso, can't swallow. It involves walking a sibling through siblingship that is completely abnormal compared to her comparative peers. It's having to have, you know, the death talk regularly when he's in and out of hospital, in and out of ITU. Having to have those conversations around what will happen, what will it look like, when will it be? Because ultimately we didn't know, we won't know when it will be. But one minute she's proud of him, next minute she hates him. Takes all your time, mummy, you're always tired. You've always got all of this time for Caleb, but never for me. And it's such a fine balance. Caleb needs suction twice a day. He needs respiratory physio. He needs to have uh, peg feeding. He needs to have his peg changed. You know, he needs to go through, he's fed via a pump. He doesn't get to taste the euphoria of what food feels like and tastes like to enjoy scoffing his face full of chocolate cake. You know, and again, going back to that respect form, and I have to look at that every year. Do I not want to resuscitate my baby if the time comes? You know, it could happen to any of us, but we don't know. This feels like it has a level of certainty that comes with it. So suddenly I'd become, I'd become a mum to two. I'd been a midwife but now a paediatric nurse went at home as well, welcoming all of these health professionals, and I'm grateful for them. I um, couldn't thank the NHS more than for all of these wonderful practitioners in our lives that help support the life of Caleb. But I'd really prefer that I didn't have to. I'd really prefer that my baby went to a normal school, and I'd really prefer that I didn't have to wake up in the night to give him drugs. I'd really prefer that I wouldn't have to torture him every morning and every night with suction and watch him scream, not be able to console him, not understand what he wants or says. You know, I'd really prefer that that wasn't the case for us, but it is the case for us. And so living with HIE involves so much more than waving off at the doors of a neonatal unit. It's a lifelong commitment, life-changing experience that involves so much more than anyone would ever know, the nuances that people can't account for, the not being able to go to the cinema in the evening, the having to leave a party early, to be so stuck to a routine, that if we step back from that routine, then we'll only pay for days and days. To not being able to pacify your baby as a mother, that feels wholly wrong. You know, I thought I could account for disability. I thought I could account for, you know, have all of these screening tests in pregnancy, but here I am now dealing with you know, quadriplegic, spastic, quadru uh, spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy. Here I am dealing with that. And it's just a really difficult, difficult time. And I love him to bits. I really, really do. With all of my heart, I love him to bits. And people say, oh, you wouldn't change him for the world now, would you? Oh, I'd change the experience. I'd change all of that happens to him every day, absolutely in a heartbeat. The HIE is really difficult, really difficult. And I was a firm believer as a midwife and a mother living that life out, that families should know more about this, practitioners should know more about how it affects the family. So as you can see, here are a collection of photos. I think often with social media, we're all ready to put out these amazing photos. Everything's fine. But here are some of the photos, the good and the bad parts of it. We've struggled with weight gain for Caleb, and he has been, we've had many, many times where he's been vomiting blood, and we've had to have long periods of time without him feeding, 
And so, as you can see, he looked rather skinny in some of these pictures. We've had a big hospital admission where we've been in ITU. He was in hospital 21 times in his first year of life. You know, we've, this is our first winter where we've not made it into hospital yet, and he's five. He smiles, and there he is in his equipment, in these big pieces of equipment that occupy your house, the adjustments that happen to your house. He was in ITU for pneumonia and still made it out. He was on oxygen for the first six months of life, and occasionally we still have to go back there. But in the, in the corner there, he's saying goodbye to a friend who also had HIE, that lived for a tender 18 months. But he loved him to pieces, and I know that even though he can't tell me, that he can't even express to me, that he knows and loves others. And for that, I have to be deeply grateful. So it doesn't just stop at the baby. And I think as practitioners, that's what we think and how we behave and how we do our clinical practice. All the focus is on the baby. But as I said, once again, when we go back home, what does it look like? You know, housing, huge adaptations to the house, adaptations that, you know, sellability in the future. I've got to have tracking systems everywhere. He's too heavy to hold. Finances, you can't work full time because you just, first of all, you're just too exhausted. But also, who's going to do those cares? Your work and career has to take a standpoint. But actually, I chose to take and continue my career, which was a journey that I might talk about a little bit later on. But work was so supportive in me coming back. But it does make a massive, massive difference. Social aspects, you know, you can't do those evening play dates with your other child. You can't go out with making, without making sure that the right people are in place to look after your son. If something happens, he chokes or he needs suction. Time. I don't have any of that anymore. You know, the quality time to sit and rest because it is such a time-consuming element of my life. It's mental health. I've been very blessed in that I have had a good support system around me, but I've had to battle with the highs and the lows, the what-ifs, the guilt. I'm a midwife. Surely I should have known something was wrong when I was experiencing those contractions. Surely I should have pushed him out quick enough. Surely it was something that I did. Maybe it was karma. I never saved that baby's life four weeks before. These were genuine conversations, genuine quiet voices that I was experiencing for at least three years following his birth. It's really only taken me in this job to sit down with other bereaved parents and talk them through that guilt process for me to understand that it was okay not to be okay that the mental health elements of it had to be discussed, had to be revealed. They couldn't be those still small, quiet voices in your head. Support networks. Unfortunately, it's one of those situations where you find out who are your real friends who will get in the trenches with you. But you also make new friendships for those people that show and extend compassion. Marriage and relationships. You know, I'm now divorced from Caleb's father, and albeit amicable, still a really distressing time in my life and will still have implications as life proceeds with the children. It changes you forever. You're never the same person. You don't ever, you know, whether he could do, whether Caleb could do more things, I think even just the very trauma of it all leaves you changed forever. I will never be that woman that I was the day, the morning of the labour. So what does it mean to us as clinical practitioners? You know, we have all of these big national drivers, each baby counts, saving babies' lives. We know that saving babies' lives came up with the elements of reduced fetal movements, fetal growth restriction, reducing smoking, prematurity, fetal monitoring, all elements that we can improve and do better with. You know, Caleb doesn't really fall into that space, even through investigation, constantly going through it in my head. Unfortunately, we didn't get an answer. There was no abruption, no high blood pressure, no infection. You know, he was moving beautifully before it happened. So we just don't know why, and sometimes that does happen. And that's, I think, really hard for a clinician to get their head around and to understand. 
We need to look at the communication errors that we have. We need to look at the way that we work as teams. We need to look at the way that we escalate. We need to look at the way we risk assess people. They are so, so important. Should I have stayed that day when I had that scan? Clinically, there wasn't a reason to do so. This year, you know, we've had the Ockenden report showing how we can do things better, how we can reduce brain injuries. What can we do about our care? A welcomed report, but a report that carries a gravitas that we need to act on. As a bereavement midwife, here I am really working with that report to make sure that our bereaved families get what they can. We've got Inve independent investigation bureaus such as HSIB working on our behalf to look at systems and processes. We don't need to play the blame game. I wanted to play the blame game so much. I wanted to point at somebody, something, and say it was you. It's you that has given me this life-changing event that I can't stop, nor halt, nor do anything about. But we have to look at what we're doing now and how we can change the now and hopefully sharing things like my journey can be a part of that. So what are some of the practice pitfalls that we're seeing out? Failure to escalate, mismanagement of fetal presentation, errors in the detection of abnormalities on the CTG, slow response to fetal distress, failure to promptly manage uterine issues such as placental or cord issues, failure to recognise high-risk pregnancies, failure to transfer to appropriate birth settings, human factors, workload, communication errors, lack of psychological safety, and a lack of understanding and education. What are we doing? What do we need to see change? How can we work this out? We are seeing that HIE cases, we are reducing them, which is an incredible, incredible win on so, many, so much of the hard work that all of these practitioners do. We're going towards one intention baby by baby, case by case, making changes to our outcomes and our skill sets as well. I know that these areas, these are areas that we've talked about numerous times. And even though it feels like sometimes we're not learning, I promise you that we are learning. I know that the care that we give to women is improving. We're listening to women much more in their families. I do wonder if we could just communicate that a little bit better. That we could work on how we approach situations where, like mine, where there wasn't an answer, there wasn't a reason, it was completely out of the blue. I've worked with many disabled um, children and families and all that they've been through and their stories are quite similar. So I don't want you to feel disheartened by stories like mine but I want you to also feel that you've stopped and take a moment to think, actually, everything I do, I need to pay attention to my intentions. And that the main thing in all of this is that we protect the lives of the women and the babies that come into our care. We need to practice that psychological safety of just saying, hey, I'm not okay with what's going on here. I'm not okay with this CTG monitoring. I'm not okay that this woman looks unwell. I'm not okay that these fetal movements are still reduced. And escalating, get the support. There's never anything that will be deemed stupid or unnecessary. It's important that we act when we need to. Now, transactional practice. This is something that I've experienced personally. And I guess thinking about that, I've then been able to look at it professionally as well. So through no fault of anybody's, and perhaps because I'm a midwife, I felt that I was transacted. Okay. And what we should be doing is transitioning women. Okay. They've been with us since they booked. They, there was this innate trust with a the midwife. They've been with us through their labour. And then suddenly, as this baby is born, and things have gone wrong, they're then transacted into a different department instead of being transitioned, and then we wave our goodbye at the maternity doors leading into the neonatal unit. I feel really strongly about who is bridging the gap between obstetrics and Nike. They're suddenly thrusted into this environment where you have a number of incredibly skilled specialists who are specialists in babies. 
So they surround the incubator, surround the babies. But what about the mum and the dad, the family sitting there completely blindsided, feeling deeply vulnerable? Where's the midwife? Where's the transition there? How have we not transitioned ourselves? And perhaps one could argue that it's about blame. I don't want to show, I don't want to go, I don't know, I don't understand the neonatal unit enough. I don't know if the parents are going to be angry at me. What if someone blames me? And I think if we can get beyond our own self and think about putting that patient first, then we can help these families transition into the, into the neonatal unit so that all of the family, that holistic approach, is completely supported. The team on the neonatal units do a phenomenal job but they are specialists with babies. I had really interesting communications with them. They spoke to me like I was a health professional, not like a mother. That was hard. That was hard, but I get it as well. But I was told things in a matter-of-fact way that I felt blindsiding. I was told that results were really poor before I was given the results. And so I was treated as if I was a member of the team which is not okay. I needed to be treated like a mother. At the same time, if you'd asked me at that point, out of pure need for control, I probably would have asked, please, 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 just treat me like one of you guys. So it's a difficult, it's a difficult journey for the clinical practitioners out there. I think for me, we need to look at how we can work better together, as I've previously mentioned. We need to go from helping guide these women through labour and birth and through their entire pregnancy, to then support them in that neonatal period and working, interlinking our training together with the neonatal unit. There's things that we can learn from them and they from us. We need to increase our understanding of what happens beyond those doors. That not to carry this ignorance that it's no longer my problem, no longer my situation, that actually, what can I do for that family? And I think that interlinked care, the way that we can transition women would be so much better for their mental health, their mental well-being, for trauma. And I know that we carry such compassion fatigue in this job, but I do think there are small nuances that we can do better. That as health professionals, it takes no time at all to check in with that family and say, is there anything that I can do for you too? Baby's being sorted, but what can I do for you? Brave conversations, oh, it makes everyone feel uncomfortable. Doing this job in bereavement particularly, I've learned how to do brave conversation. We need to step outside of the binary and habitual thinking, whether someone's trauma is glaring or subtle. It's all relevant to that individual. It's still trauma. It's still inevitably going to change the way that that individual or family live out their lives thereafter. And there's no disputing the trauma that I experienced will forever live with me. The flashbacks of those moments, the, the pain that was involved physically, mentally, emotionally, the way it strikes me now five years on, the way it pricks my eyes when I'm sitting with a bereaved family about how I wish I could start over. People ask me, will you have any more children? You know, for Eden, who's my daughter. I think, how could I? How could I even go back there? And perhaps that's something that I carry with me and will work through at some point. But 18 months of therapy, divorce, life-changing, house adaptations, financial changes. Brave conversation is something that I'm really proud of. Conversations that I feel are important. Is our best guess, our best evidence-based guess enough? because there's still so much that we don't know. Are we appropriately trained as individuals, as clinicians, to be able to deliver that information in a way that's protective? Because trust me, you remember every single word. Would I still have and braved some of the decisions that I made at the time? I've asked myself that so many times. At that 18 hour mark and they said to me, Becky, Best, it's going to be in Kayla's best interest that we withdraw care because the outcome of this is going to be extremely poor. And I fought them on that. Would I fight them now? I don't know if I would. Because when you see your child go through pain all of the time, 
when you see your child be treated differently, when you see your child be treated differently, even within healthcare, because they can't say, do you know what, stop doing that to me, it hurts. That's really difficult, you become your child's advocate. But over time, you know, that's it's exhausting. What is the right thing for you? What is the right thing for them? You know, you grow your children to be these wonderful humans that can express themselves in whatever that might look like. How explicit is appropriate when we're advising families? How much do we tell a parent about the outcome when ultimately nobody really knows? I was told that he would die within a matter of minutes and we've just celebrated his fifth birthday. But also, would I have a different life if he did? Would I have struggled as much? Would I still be married? Questions that I don't know the answer to. So, personal and professional balance. This was something that arguably, I don't know if I've actually honed yet, but it's a very fine line. Learning to live with acute and chronic trauma it's really difficult and it's really difficult not to cross those boundaries as well, even in this job now, but also in my home life. I carried a sense of responsibility, as I previously said, that it was my fault. I'm a midwife and a mother. I should have known that Caleb was in trouble, that something was happening, something potentially unavoidable. As I said, was it karma? Can't rescue one baby, so why does my baby deserve to live? Shame, anger, shame. I felt embarrassed to the other colleagues, like, like, I'd, like I'd had a home birth on purpose or something, like I'd caused it to happen. I felt angry that it happened to my baby. This was my redemptive birth. I felt denial. You know, I felt all of the motions of grief. That this, but I'd not allowed myself to grieve for so long. I'd later met with that family whose baby I delivered, who'd passed away. And she said to me, Becky, do you know what? I'd still rather have my situation than yours. I can't live daily knowing that my child had that brain injury and something broke inside of me at that point and I allowed, and I will be forever grateful to that family because they allowed me to eventually grieve the loss of expectation. The not knowing what the future holds you know, that, that at some point, Eden will have to stand at her brother's funeral. That I will have to plan that for my child. The disappointment, the disappointment. You know, you know it's going to be, I'm not going to get to walk with him or see him walk down the aisle. I'm not going to get to, to sit and have a pint with him at his 18th. I'm not going to get to see him run across a field, kick a football or fight with his sister and chase her. That disappointment feels raw some days. Sometimes, sometimes I'm just wholly grateful that he's here, that I've not had to do all of those things yet. The narratives of the future, narratives that I don't have any control over. But when those times and those thoughts rise, they're tangible and they're strong. As I said, work was incredible. Uh, helping me transition back into work. We had an open and brave conversations. I felt defensive. I felt like I really struggled to understand how to be the best that I could be at work without constantly thinking every baby was gonna be born dead. But I made it because people stuck by me, people heard me, people saw me. Of course, I experienced all of the horrible comments that people would make completely with no intention to be horrible but well at least you've got this and at least you've got that and if I could have chosen you to have a disabled child it'd be you. People all just trying to provide that tender communication but really painful at the same time because we're not equipped to do awkward and it's something as I said I feel passionate about but I have to work really hard to work on my personal and professional balance. I have a really good support system and not everyone does. So how are we helping these families? So we need to get better at increasing our knowledge around how we can refer these people. How do we, as midwives, how do we go down the route of 
making sure that people are aware, clinically aware of their bodies during pregnancy and what to look out for deviations from the norm without quite scaremongering a population. It took me a long time to believe in the power of the female body again. To sit down with women to talk about screening for disability. How can you screen out something like what I've been through? You can't. How can we help be the best practitioners in the worst situation? But work showed up for me. They really did. And they helped me transition. And they helped me to remember that I don't need to be defined by what's happened to me and what's happened to Caleb. That I can still be Caleb's voice and Caleb still gets to make changes even without all of the, any mobility, any cognitive understanding, any voice, he still gets to move mountains just by being him. So recommendations for practice. How do we apply all of this to practice? And why does you knowing my story have anything to do with practice development? So some of the recommendations I wanted to talk about was Specialist roles to bridge the gap between neonates and maternity. Improving the relationship between the disciplinaries. I think that's really important. And that could look like doing joint training days together. Improved fetal monitoring. And now we have fetal monitoring specialists in place. And thanks to Ockenden, that is something that we're really pushing for, as well as saving babies' lives. The importance of chaperones and family support. Some of the ways that I, were communicate, I was communicated to during my time in the neonatal unit wasn't okay. A consultant shared all of the results with me, which were catastrophic results, with a chaperone or my husband present, and it made me feel really vulnerable. Educating students. We need to start right at the beginning. Educating students, preparing them, priming them for what an ever-changing career, ever-changing practice looks like as new and more evidence comes out. The feedback and the MDT approach, practice the psychological safety as I've mentioned, but let's get feedback. What did we do well? What did we not do well? Get rid of all of this pride and get over ourselves a little bit and say, do you know what, let's be more teachable. Let's learn from the families. Let's have the peers. I would happily sit down with another family trying to make those decisions and be explicit about my experience. Not through a need of coercion, but just to see what it's like on the other side, a lens into the future. Brave discussions, maybe having some teaching around that. How do we approach diagnosis, subsequent pregnancies, wider support? The buddy systems between fives and sixes, band fives and fives, band sixes, and how we can really start to guide people up into their career. So, as we come to the end of my presentation, I want to remind you that if this is a collective work, that it involves everybody, that it goes beyond the baby, goes beyond those hospital doors. How do we look at the acceptance of choice? How do we be the voices for those babies? How do we promote their dignity, their best interest, but also the best interest of the families? How do we be explicit with the outcome without disempowering them as parents and their choices. How can we be better at this? I think being equipped as professionals is the key. And what that might look like is something for the future for us all to take forward from some of the points that I've mentioned in this presentation. I really value you listening to me, taking the time to listen to my story. I value that you took the time to hear my son's voice, to see my son, that just because he can't do all the things that everyone else can do, that he has had a moment of your time to express his journey and what that meant for us and the wider family. So thank you.